<laughs> okay, so uh, welcome to the Launch and Learn on uh, Apple Advocacy with Jack Watson and Beth Hughes, both uh, uh, Court of Appeal judges on the NWT Court of Appeal from Alberta. Um, and we're going to get started. Um, if you have questions, don't hesitate to ask them, but we would ask that you uh, raise your hand or something of that nature. Yeah, use one of those little gimmicky things. Yeah, or or, <laughs> you know, or whatever you want. Or just break in. Um, yeah. We're having some. We have to figure out how to how to do this with sharing the screen, and having participants, and you know that kind of thing. So just jump in if you have questions, or if you can save them till the end, that would be better. Okay, uh, so we're going to start by sharing the screen. Let's see if we can figure out the screen. We too understand the challenges with hybrid systems and in fact, uh, we um, in Alberta cannot do hybrid or cannot do them well it's either all virtual or all in person but anyways that's uh, we're working on a good hybrid system. But let me just throw in a commercial yes. though, we got the best um, information management system of any appeal court in the country whips everyone. That's true. That's true. <laughs> Anyways, we're here to just to talk about practices for effective advocacy, both in terms of getting started, your written advocacy, as well as your oral or ad advocacy. And I'll start off on the first slide. It says practices to adopt, getting started, review the appeal rules. And I would probably begin with uh, something else even before review the appeal rules. That's the next slide, Bob, I think. Mm -hmm. And that is make sure you understand what your statute or the underlying law allows you in regards to your appeal period. You have to know what gives you the authority to appeal to the Court of Appeal because all appeals are statutory beasts. And so unless you can find the authority for your appeal, you don't get to just come up and uh, join the uh, Court of Appeal for a little get together. So that's really the first part. And then once you have found your jurisdiction, and I suggest remember to review the appeal rules. It just um, ensures that you stay on track and your factum stays on track and you don't... Um, I told him I quick call because I want to lunch and learn in the elementary I've got all the documents, printed everything out, but there's too much here um, for me to go through. So give me a quick summary. We've got, I've got the, the chart that was printed. Okay, there we go. We'll, uh, we'll just remind everybody, mute your mics, please, but please ask questions when. Anyways, review the appeal rules. Know, know what the rules are. And the rules, depending on where you are, will include things like font size, uh, size of margins, things like that. You don't want to have your factum bounced by the clerks uh, just because you haven't read the rules. So just check those sorts of things before you get started. And maybe if I could, uh, I could step in too at this point, you should understand one thing about the appeal court process itself, just like uh, Beth just said, it's a statutory process, but it's also important for you to understand that um, almost everything that appeal courts do is in the nature of statutory construction. I'm not sure where I'm supposed to look at where the camera is, but over there. Okay. Yeah. Um, the um, in, in fact, I would say 90% of what the Supreme Court of Canada does is statutory construction in one form or another. In fact, the most important case in the last 30 years probably wasn't the one you think of. It isn't Collins or any of those. It's Rizzo shoes. Okay. If you memorize Rizzo shoes, you're probably safe. But anyway, I, I mentioned that just for Eugene Meehan, and he's sitting in there somewhere, probably laughing at what the absurdities of us. But the point is, though, is that. Uh, you really have to know, for the, not only for the purposes of reading the rules to be prepared for the hearing, you have to know what the statute and regulatory structure is for your appeal. If you don't, you're done. Like it, because you cannot make a valid argument if you don't have that ready. And one other thing, uh, I'll turn it over to, to Beth again. And that is, when I used, I used to do a lot of appeals. In fact, that's where I ran into Eugene uh, from time to time down in Ottawa. And um, the, uh, my theory was this. If you can't get your argument on one sheet of paper, okay, if you can't get it there, 
you haven't got an argument. And it's possible to get it there. I mean, if you really can work at it, and I in fact, there would be times where I'd actually run under my time limit in front of the Supreme Court. I've noticed that, by the way, though, watching uh, the channel, that uh, most lawyers are like that. They're very crisp, on topic, boom. So anyway, sorry, oh, sorry, Beth, no, I just no, had to chip no, that in. No, 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 those are all good points. So in terms of getting started as well, if we flip to the next page, we've got some other practices to avoid. And the rules, and, and I apologize to those who practice here, but when we were putting this together, in Alberta, we call them rules. I wasn't sure if it was rules or section number, so I'm embarrassed to admit that. But anyway, so it's either section 19 or rule 19 of the rules, um, talk about extracts of key evidence. What we're finding, uh, because people can file electronically, and that will come to each jurisdiction, that with electronic filing, lawyers do not have to be very, um, they don't screen as carefully as they used to, because the cost is not there. You don't have to, you might photocopy one, but if you're filing everything electronically, then the same cost is not there as opposed to six copies. So we're getting what we see or what we call as a document dump on the extracts of key evidence that people are putting together materials they say are relevant to the appeal itself. And I can tell you that the word extracts of key, underlining key appears to be missed. And we are looking for key documents, not every single document that uh, was before the hearing judge or the trial judge or the chamber's judge or whatever. So begin to think about um, your argument, as Jack said, and understanding what it is you need to support your argument. And what can't be included um, are your arguments or your written briefs or even authorities from the lower uh, court new evidence does not come in uh, this category at all. And so be careful exactly what it is you are using. Uh, there's another comment, I, I just again, a follow up on what Beth was just saying. I've noticed that in addition to the fact that because it's electronic, you're getting all this stuff included in the EKEs because the lawyer is nervous about what might be asked or something like that. There are also uh, some, some lawyers are now trying to um, bootleg into their EKEs, the memorandums of argument used in the lower court. And that's a that's a, 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 a neat trick to try and expand on your fact and size. You know, and I that's I have to say, is not it underwhelms the appeal court if you start saying, oh, like, well, not only did I argue this, I argued it before, and I argued it better before, and had more space to argue it in, and so on. Um, believe me, we're not that dumb. We figured it out. Yeah, and you could expect your colleague to actually ask for that to be removed from your extract of key evidence, or you could expect the registry to also ask you to remove it. In very rare, rare circumstances, written briefs might be something needed, but you want to make sure that it's one of those rare cases first, rather than um, just going ahead and filing. Yeah, uh, the last bullet on this page is fresh evidence or new evidence. Jack, yeah. can you hit that? Sure, like, I, 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 I suppose they probably wonder, what is the difference between fresh evidence and new evidence? Fresh evidence is evidence which was available at the time, but you didn't use it. New evidence is new. It means after the, after the trial or after the appeal quite often even. Uh, and um, so just as that's a, you know, maybe just semantics, but the point is though that fresh evidence is what normally people try to offer. You know, we don't see much new evidence, you know. Uh, so fresh evidence is one of those situations where it's a witness who wasn't called at the time or, uh, you know, or, or some, it, it goes so far as the cross-examination that didn't happen or things of that sort. Unfortunately, because we have uh, self-represented litigants at all, and I don't mean that unfortunate in the sense of, uh, you know, uh, it's not a, a desirable characteristic of a legal system, but they are, the unfortunate part, they don't have a legal education. So as a consequence, they will jam fresh evidence into their factums consistently and into their authorities consistently, or, you know, and, it, you know, I mean, I, that's actually, that's a slight exaggeration, consistently to the wrong word. I don't mean a pejorative. I just mean that they don't know the difference between what was the evidence and what was they, they, they wish the evidence was. 
And what we don't want to see though with lawyers that they fall into the same trap. You know, we, we have to go, that goes back to the jurisdiction that Beth started off with. We only have jurisdiction to review the decision that was made. We, we don't review a decision that could have been made, you know? And so it's very important for you to understand that. Now, if in fact you had a formal application for new evidence, there's a whole process for that. And again, it goes back to understanding the rules, you know, and you have to give the other side an opportunity to, to debate whether your evidence is admissible or not and so on. So, but that's an important part. Don't try to sneak stuff in there. There's one other thing that people have started doing and do it at trials too. They sneak expert opinion into this stuff. They try to get, you know, they file articles like learned articles from psychologists and all this kind of stuff. That's tries. They try to get that in there too doesn't work. We're not entitled to look at that stuff. If it's it was a debatable piece of expert opinion, it had to be debated. It's not in front of us. We don't take judicial notice very much and we're not entitled to it, actually. A good example where you'll see new evidence more, more frequently, I would suggest, it deal is in the family law context and information about children that has come forward since the hearing. So that's an example of where you might get new evidence. Um, I was going to say, can you remember? Yes, I was going to say the, the Supreme Court of Canada case that began that begins with a G. I oh, know it's very, very great. Yes, I knew Jack yeah. would remember yeah. it. Is a great case to look at in regards to new evidence and fresh evidence. Right. It's, yeah. In fact, they've really tightened it up as far as their role is concerned. But they've also they were very critical of appeal courts for yes. for in effect falling into the trap of having it like a movable feast, you know, that the, 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 and, it, and it's understandable why we get into this because family cases are not static. Like it's one thing to have us, you know, breach a contract or something that's static. Nothing's going to happen much, but children grow up. And by the time it gets to an appeal court, a year's gone by and they've changed schools or there's lots of sorts of things, health conditions. So you can understand why the parties think in the matter as a matter of justice, they should have the opportunity to put this in front of the court of appeal because they're doing an academic case by then. Something's really happened. And, you know, um, I have to say, it's hard to know what the what a good answer to that is. Is there's a legal answer, and the legal answer is we can't do it. But then they say, well, what are we appealing for? That we're appealing from a chamber's. This goes back to the question of whether you should even appeal interlocutory rulings in chambers cases. There's a good chance you shouldn't, unless they're desperately um, you know, there's some great injustice or something that's going to flow from them. Um, there's not a lot we can do it because by the time we get an interlock, we call them fast tracks. You maybe can talk a little bit about fast tracks if you like. Yeah. You know, no. Yeah, but anyway, the idea that we we try to get them on as fast as we possibly can because we know that the situation is mobile. You know, the things are happening, and um, but the, I would say almost invariably they're involving cases where an exercise of discretion was was, was done by a judge in relation to say uh, access or parenting time. Or, you know, uh, uh, amount of support for children in a certain period of time. So quite often they're even, they're even time limited. Like they say, well, that's until the trial or that's until November or that's in some other kind of date like that. And you can imagine, well, what, what is the Court of Appeal going to do? I mean, what, what, uh, by the time we get there, it, it, the date that was fixed for it to run out is probably reached. You know, so, there, it, you know, I, I don't want to whine about that or anything like that, but I'm just saying that you have to be realistic when you're dealing with your, your clients. If it's a matter of principle, I can sort of understand that, but even principle has a timeline. It can well, expire. <laughs> and a cost. Yeah. Which often involves business cost analysis. But yeah. uh, yeah. anyways, but there are certain things just following up on what Jack said before we get to the next slide. And that is, is to assess how long will it take to get your appeal on as fast as possible from the filing of the notice of appeal until you get a hearing date? Because sometimes when you actually add up that time period, you may decide, more particularly if we're talking about an interim application, especially in the family law context, you might be better off with a review or just waiting for things to change. When Jack was talking about fast tracks, in Alberta, we have what's called a fast track there, a category of appeal. It's an appeal of primarily interlocutory matters. Yeah, and, and they're and quite children. often family, but not always. I mean, yeah. we get civil cases, injunctions, and you know, various things that are urgent, basically. Yeah. And we can get them on really quick, actually. There, there's, you know, yes, but, but, you, but, this, but this was what I was gonna say. Really yeah. quick means six months. 
So really quick, my uh, six months isn't in some categories, isn't really quick. So you need to make that assessment right. in terms of your notice of appeal. Shall we go to the next sure. slide? This is one of my pet peeves and I see it. Um, don't force the panel to independently seek out and sift through the record below to fill in the gaps. And I find this in particular on criminal appeals when the ground of appeal deals with a ruling uh, of voir dire ruling or charter ruling of some sort. So yeah, you've got the uh, final decision in there at the end in the appeal record. And I go looking for the, uh, say the section seven ruling or section eight or the 24-2. And uh, I am sifting through the transcript because people have not put it into the in, in into their factum as an appendix or whatever. Another example would, might be something on a sentencing, again, in the criminal context, it was something marked as an exhibit or should have been marked as an exhibit in the sentencing hearing, but for whatever reason it wasn't. Well, then include it as an appendix. How else when we're reading the transcript are we supposed to know, but we're going to be looking for it and um, don't make us hunting for materials. The, uh, there is an interesting thing that the rulings now, I notice interlocutory rulings by judges in the trial courts are increasingly put on Canley, you know, because the judges are trying to be helpful. So that's a Canley source is not a bad idea. In other words, I would make sure though that you wouldn't stick it in with your authorities, make a distinction between this is actually record and this is authority so that we know that what we're looking for there. Because um, to be honest, most of us have read using the Nicolation a hundred times, or we have actually. But you know what I mean? There's, a, there's pretty standard authorities on things we don't have to look at very often. And um, indeed, now that we're going to hypertech links uh, and online kind of work, uh, you know, we, we never are going to have that paperwork around there. But one thing, um, uh, as far as this independent sifting, uh, I think Alberta is not different from other parts of the country now, because for the longest time, when I started, you know, almost, you know 50 years ago, um, judges were not, don't, they didn't read anything. They just, they, they, they had, they got a fact and they might've skinned through it, but then they go in there and they're sort of cool. The judges are now hot, which means that they've read stuff. Like our court, for example, is extremely hot. Like we, generally speaking, we've read everything that has been placed before the court, you know? And uh, so if you wait, you know, cause us to wash around at all sorts of irrelevant stuff, we're not, we're not only hot one way, we may be hot the other way, you know? But um, the, uh, you know, the simple fact of the matter is though that, um, this business of trying to hunt and peck through stuff to find something you consider to be important is, is why we produce something called a condensed book. And the condensed book was to get past the EKE, the, the exit, uh, extracts, with the idea being that, okay, if you're going to refer to something, give us one page of each thing you're going to refer to. So in other words, the condensed book isn't in, in any kind of logical book. It's just a bunch of single pages all put together. And it might be a hundred of them. But then you say, so I, I want you to refer to that page. I want you to refer to that page. You know? So you're jumping around a little bit. But that's an area where you might be able to fill in the gaps like that if you use something called a condensed book. But that's know. for your oral argument. That's for your oral argument, right. Yeah. And uh, anyway, the other last thing is, is uh, please stay up to date. You know, the Supreme Court of Canada is, is rolling out stuff now at a great pace. And uh, don't be shy about bringing new cases from the Supreme Court after your fact. Know because those things are going to be discussed because we'll have read them already. Yeah. And when we're at, saying don't force the panel to independently seek out, I'll give you a, an example. I'm looking for the re well, this is I was looking for the reasons of the trial judge, they are not part of um, anybody's material. So I go into the transcript, and sure, of, of course, I can find them there. But then I look at the factum of the appellant file, and they have used the Canley version, which has paragraph numbers. Well, I, first of all, hunted back, found the decision, which isn't appendix to anybody's um, factum, and I'm looking at line numbers when I start to read and make notes, and then the factum is using uh, paragraph numbers. You know, don't... When Jack talks about making us hot, things like that are, you know, they're annoying and you don't want to annoy is really what it boils down to, shall we? I know, so one other thing, by the way, before we leave this topic, and that is that uh, when you're referring to transcript materials, 
we, we have to be very conscious of the fact that there's an awful lot of uh, conscripted privacy going on in the court system. And there's going to be names of children and there's going to be names of sexual assault victims and this sort of thing, which will be in those transcripts. And if they're attached to your materials without being in any, any way sort of subject to some kind of a sealing order, um, we, there may be collateral damage to what you're doing. You know, because we're talking about we're going on the internet with this stuff. Like, well, the court cases go on the internet too, unfortunately. And so, um, uh, personally, I actually would prefer if lawyers would move off if there's Canley available that they say in their fact that we're citing to Canley, not to the yeah. transcript. So then we don't have to worry about it. And the one good thing is that Canley gives us a buffer on that very point of privacy because they edit. They're actually pretty good, Canley, in my experience, in terms of taking out the names of children that's that become. DK or AB or whatever, um, and um, so at least we, we're at least covered that way because we 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 have a very high degree of sense of responsibility towards people who can be hurt completely collaterally. Look at that uh, case of that guy down in BC there, uh, that Coban character. You know they, they, they use you know, they use this information for sextortion as they call it and things like that. So we got to be very very worried about that. So next slide. Tom. Oh, 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 sorry. Okay. No, yeah. I thought we were at the fact of Miss Key. Sorry, I made you go one too far. Yeah, yeah. one too far. I apologize. Yeah. I can get that one. Okay, that okay. one. Yeah, that's all we're asking. Oh, uh, well, maybe we can't get it. Well, yeah, the fact. Um, this goes back to Jack's point about a hot court and. Most appellate courts are considered to be hot courts, and that is we have read everything in advance. And so this follows from that. Yeah, your factum is key. We are looking at it and reading it and analyzing it before we go in. We are looking at it during your argument. And if we reserve, we go back to your factum. So understand that it is very um, heavily relied upon and the strength of your written argument often makes or breaks the day. It's not that you can, tr trust me, you can persuade orally, but you have to understand that your written argument is the linchpin that holds things together on the whole. And there's another feature too, and that is that um, variations from factums, I've, I've noticed, unfortunately, there's a certain amount of that going on. Um, lawyers rethink their argument after they've written their factum. And uh, they say, well, I shouldn't have said this, or I, I, don't, know. I don't mind if you walk, I, you know, personally, it's another question whether I mind or not. If, if, if you go into court and you say, I've got six grounds of appeal, but I'm not pursuing three of them, or I got six grounds of appeal, but I'm going to let you rely on my written argument on that. I only want to talk about the th first three or whatever. We don't take that as a concession. If you walk into court and say, look, I, I'm relying on my written material for the last three or four arguments or something, you know, especially, and it's perfectly legitimate to do that when it's a situation where they're pretty cut and dry. They have a very simple element to them. If I want to talk about the complicated ones, no problem. Okay, as far as I'm concerned. But that goes back again to reinforce what, what Beth was saying about the fact that See, treat your factum as if it's you you talking. You're explaining your case, you know, that uh, because we do read them. And um, we, in fact, are quite, you know, we have some of our judges are very meticulous to the point where they can spot when you, like, you've changed it. Like you're right to the, almost to the, to the penny. <laughs> like you didn't say that before. And of course, there's also um, uh, the, the phenomenon too about like raising like charter arguments out of the blue. Like we see that periodically. You know, you're sitting on a thing and, all of a sudden, during the course of an argument, all of a section seven of the charter is now permeated into the debate or something. And we can't do that. We have we have rules about new grounds on appeal, and we don't we can't be generous about that because it goes for a jurisdiction. Should we go to the next slide? Yep. So again, this slide deals with one's factum <laughs> in terms of being rigorous, focused, and deliberate in respect of your grounds of appeal, as well as your um, argument. And while the slide says there is no magic number, really at three. most, yeah, three, <laughs> three is uh, what I say. When you're past three, um, I start to wonder if any of them have merit when there are that many errors. 
And it's, you know, it's like the old, the old saying, but they throw enough at the wall, somebody's bound to stick. Well, you know, it doesn't quite work that way in our system. No, and what I've found as well lately, and Jack, I don't know if you've seen it, that there are some lawyers that have, you know, ground one, ground two, ground three, but under each one, there are another three subheadings, which are all really other grounds of appeal. Trust me, I can figure it out when I'm writing and I'm now on ground number nine of uh, your argument, uh, my sense of humor has completely evaporated by then in regards to understanding that we're now on to every grievance imaginable. Yeah, and it actually, let me, this gives me a chance to talk a little bit about the criminal code itself. Um, uh, if you're dealing with criminal appeals, when you're attacking a conviction on an illegal offense, it's governed by three subsections of 686-1A. That's it, that's our jurisdiction. We don't have another jurisdiction. So it's got to be an error of, error of you know, facts. It's got to be, like in other words, an unreasonable verdict. It has to be an error of law or it has to be a miscarriage of justice. It doesn't have to be some melange of them and say it's approximately this or approximately that. It's like with self-defense. They used to think, well, as long as you have a reasonable doubt of one element of self-defense, you're entitled to have it put to the jury. Well, no, you aren't. <laughs> you have to have reasonable on all the elements of the thing. Well, anyways, but that's, again, it has to do with, with preparation. And the other thing too is there are 11 miscarriages of justice in your case. There won't be one. And I agree with, uh, with Beth that sometimes they, it's hard to sort of disengage them from one sort of elaborate thing. And I have no, I would have no problem personally with a ground of appeal that says the conviction was a miscarriage of justice for the following reasons. One, two, three, four. And that's a subcategory of one. But that's going back to, I'm, I'm talking about 686-183 and it's a miscarriage of justice. And here's the reason. Ding, 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 ding. At least if it's done in a kind of methodical way, you have to understand that we write our judgments very much from not just the, very little from the oral, actually, unless it changes something, more likely from the written. In fact, I don't know if you've noticed that judgments across Canada are becoming very pro forma, very, very pro forma. Statement of facts, issue, position to the parties, you know, and then you finally get down after about page 37, you know, what the judges are saying about it. And, oh, uh, you so, missed standard of review. Oh, that's another one. That's <laughs> another chapter in there that's in, in there. You know, maybe we stole that from the Americans because their federal system has their, their legal counsel write their judgments, I'm told, up until about page 12. And then they then the judges start writing after that. Well, it sort of makes sense. I think. We don't do it that way, to be honest. You know, I, I write my own stuff. I read all the appeal books. I just don't do that. Uh, so the second check, disagreement with the trial judge's findings. Yeah. We see that um, quite common, or that becomes a common thread where the appellant is unhappy with the, with the credibility findings in particular of the trial judge. And if that's your sole basis of appeal, that I don't like the credibility findings, and you think that you're going to get a redo in the Court of Appeal. I hate to tell you this, you're sadly mistaken. Courts of Appeal aren't for redos, they are for legal errors. And this is where you do have to understand the standard of review because we are looking for, you know, where is the legal error? Where has the judge got the task wrong? Just because you don't like the the credibility finding doesn't mean that the trial judge has erred in that way. Is there a palpable and overriding error in terms of the judge's understanding of the facts? Well, if there is, then point that out to us. Um, you using the same arguments uh, that you use in your closing submissions, but in your factum, aren't going to get us there. It's just different inferences drawn from the same body of facts. And remember, uh, appellate courts can use the arguments of trial counsel as a basis for why everything is just there, 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 there are no errors. This was a live issue. It was fully argued. Sure, it may not be been completely addressed, but that in itself may not be enough to get you there. Right, it was in fact, it raised this, uh, there's a couple of things I'm gonna pick out of that. One of it has to do with mootness, because uh, that happens. You know, you got a situation, I think it can be moot because it's premature. In other words, too soon. You haven't got there yet. You got, you know, it's interlocutory or something like that. Something's gonna happen. Um, that's, that's a mootness thing. And you may get frustrated because you may have gone through a whole bunch of work and a great argument. And you walk in there and say, 
but isn't the trial judge going to deal with this? You know, and pow, out you go. I, you know, or that's a that's a prematurity one. Then the other move is, of course, is it's died in process. You know, the issue is no longer an active one. It's been finished off, and uh, or it's a collateral attack. You know, in fact, your argument isn't really an attack on what this judge did. It's an attack on some ruling that was made that this judge relied upon at some earlier date. We 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 cannot. Uh, we have to obey the rule of law ourselves. And we can't be meandering out, you know, and try to, you know, like a night air looking for errors to find. Another thing, too, <clears throat> might be useful to mention, as uh, Beth put her finger on a very crucial point, that is standard of review. There are, there's essentially four kinds of standard of review that are available. Error of law is attracted, attracts correctness. That a lot is now confirmed that in the administrative law area as well, more or less. Um, uh, despite the presumption of reasonableness, you know, we can get into that. Uh, um, the detail. Not yeah, not today. Um, <laughs> error of fact, of course, then, as, as, as uh, Beth said, is palpable and overriding error. That is now solidly established as the only challenge to an error of fact. Really yeah. big. Yeah. In other words, it has to be obvious to the eye and it has to be material to the outcome. If it's obvious, and even if it's material to something, but not material to the outcome, it's not palpable and over, it's not overriding error. The third one is exercise of discretion. Now, the test for exercise of discretion in relation to criminal matters is actually miscarriage of justice. It isn't all this other stuff. It's whether it's a miscarriage of justice. In the civil area, of course, it has to do with whether or not there has been a uh, serious or fa uh, facial error of law or principle, whether or not there has been a uh, uh, the, the exercise of that discretion produced an actual uh, injustice that's sort of obvious on its face. Um, and that's sort of basically where the, the abuse of discretion falls. And then finally, there's unfairness in the process itself. Okay, and that's not a standard review question anyway. What that is, that's a totally different line of inquiry. It has, that line of inquiry has to do with whether or not the process itself was fair. And what we decide is not whether it was erroneous. We decide whether it was fair. And uh, so, but like I say, all of those things though, you can see what a high standard they are. Because they, again, go to our jurisdiction, Go to our ability to get remedy, and that's the way it is. <clears throat> I think the last or the last or the next slide, this is sort of a we've hit this in many ways. Do see the forest for the trees, don't yeah. get lost in the detail, understand what is relevant and what is not relevant to your particular ground of appeal. Um, as well, by the way, this goes with the other side too, though. The other yeah. side, the responding side, I think are some of the most effective response arguments I've ever seen, they don't get lost in the forest either. And they're not throwing new answers at you. They're saying, we agree with that. <clears throat> because they know that a fact that is agreed upon has been settled by a judge and nobody's gonna argue about that. They have a more important thing they wanna talk about. So I, I would encourage respondents to be at least as responsible as appellants. <clears throat> Sorry about that. Oh, no, no, no. And this last check mark, um, I think you've got to assess your case very carefully in regards to what your what your grounds of appeal are. Are are you raising something that does have a potential broader view? Right. If you do, then mm -hmm. you can be uh, you should expect the court to ask questions. There are cases though that are so narrow it. It, it won't. Yeah. And so you have to know where you are on that spectrum. If you're writing your factum on a very narrow matter and it doesn't have a public policy implication, then don't use all the nice wordy introduction things that they tell you to do in appellate advocacy about why you yeah, should. Yeah, blue belt, yeah, time and can't or whatever. Yeah. You forget about that stuff. Yeah. Um, uh, the, I suppose, on, on the, again, on the question of this uh, public policy implications, though, um, I, you may be disappointed from time to time about the fact that we, we are not, it's not moot, but we stay back. We, you know, appeal courts are obliged to be reticent. We have to show some humility. And it may be that you, you, you'd like to uh, couch your argument as, as some grand issue that, and it may even have certain implications of a grand nature. Don't expect the appeal court to, to ride that train with you. We're not really entitled. We can say only what we got. And um, some of our judges are, you know, I, I'm sure this is the same across Canada. There's all sorts of judges who are very, I wouldn't say minimalist is an unfair way to describe it, but they say, what do we have to decide? 
we had there's an old notion that says if it's not necessary to decide it, it's necessary not to decide it. That's a, a strong view amongst. That's not every judge. In, in, in an appeal. No, but it's I'd say the majority's view, and the reason being is that we we have all seen the cases where the court has gone or a court has perhaps gone a bit further than what the facts are and they have said something. And then it comes back to a case where the actual facts are there and now there's a problem. Yeah, I mean, we throw these hand grenades laying around, the pin out, you know. <laughs> yeah, and so we, so you can invite us to go down a certain path, but most of us are, going to decline the invitation and we're going to keep it as narrow as we can and so that we don't for lack of a better term you know that legal phrase so so we're not mucking up the law for other cases and there's other there's, there's a contaminating effect too if you overshoot that way because then uh, the other side will say well look they just they're just here to have this grand principle decided that doesn't really arise in this case their whole argument is based on this so throw them out and you know that's a kind of a nuance backwards and they say, well, they, you actually have lost your, your little focused argument because it's been swept away. Uh, and like Benny said about uh, the, into the open, open sea, you know, by these other stuff. So anyway. And I think the next slide simplify. Uh, this is the same as what we said in regards to the extracts of key evidence. You know, please uh, try to just uh, get us to the right place. And so that we're not on a, a hunt and search mission in your BAFTA. Then in terms of the next point applies obviously up yeah, the next slide to both written and oral advocacy. And that is don't misrepresent. Yeah. Do you want to hit? Oh yeah, this is a, um, fortunately in my long years, uh, I haven't seen a lot of this. Um, I think the, the, the closest I you see normally though is where council actually genuinely believes what they're saying they actually you know believe that this was what happened during the trial because they were there you know and they'll have a note and everything and they'll i sometimes wonder if they've read the appeal book because they they're remembering the part of the trial so they write an argument based on that and in fact what happens is um because we often like say some of us even read the appeal books we say well, let's talk about this and it's, you can imagine how embarrassing that is. You're standing there and a judge just says, oh, what, just a minute, what page is on that on? And then he, and you dig and dig and dig, you can't find it. Well, I'll, I'll have my student, you know, it, first of all, you look incompetent when you do that. And of course, that's not even fair to say. And then the second thing is it turns out it wasn't said. The judge didn't say that. The judge says something else. It might have been something close, <laughs> but close is not, that's okay for horseshoes, but it doesn't get law, you know? Yeah. And you may think, oh, well, that doesn't happen. And it doesn't happen a lot. When it does, it um, is not a winning strategy. There's a case from Alberta by the name of Saddleback. Mm -hmm. And it was last year. Yeah. Uh, it just struck me. It was a case of misrepresenting the law, the facts, they were the facts the lawyer wanted them to be. They weren't the facts in the transcript. Peter the whole um, ultimately, uh, stretching the uh, cri criticisms of the court individually of judges. Uh, these are not uh, winning strategies. And there, and when I say that, you you may think, well, but maybe the uh, criticism is. Legitimate. Legitimate criticism is one thing, but to say that someone is uh, just a judge who's searching for power, or some words to that, I can't even remember what it was. It wasn't included in the materials, but I had a couple of the same, or the factums and two other appeals of the same lawyer. They, these are very problematic things. And in fact, this lawyer probably should have um, well, he already is before the law society. I'll just leave it at that. But uh, well, yeah, and like I said, I think most of the time, for me anyway, my experience is that most misrepresentations are innocent. Yeah. That doesn't help. <coughs> we, can't, we can't we can't operate on the basis of misrepresentations. We have to operate on the basis of what actually happened. Yeah. yeah. 
and and just remember do that last little check you know has this case been overturned if you're relying on a trial decision you know has it been overturned by the court of appeal yeah just to double check that one last time and so that you're not embarrassed and you have everything that you need to make your best argument then reasonableness the next slide John. Yeah, this right. is our last slide and we'll open it up for questions or what yeah. do you mean by or whatever yeah. well and this actually relates back to something we've covered to a certain extent that is reasonable concessions of course are in the in the category of the respondent normally but in fact the appellants can do it too and i'll tell you one thing i've i've discovered some of the best advocacy i've ever seen is where a lawyer and I, Alex Pringle is a, is a lawyer in Edmonton. We used to do this. He was master work at this because he would say, "Well, my client was convicted, and you know he doesn't agree with the determinations of fact on these issues, but you have these. These are the facts. That's what you got. But you also have this. This raises this. This is enough to terminate that." And he would do this, and he he would not even use up his time limit. And boy, did he get the the panels? Uh, you know, he said, "Yep." We're on, we're on our game. We understand what you're saying. And then the respondent, you know, it's kind of on the hook at that point. They just, gee, you know, what are you going to say? And um, so that's that's it. Focus is actually a really good thing to have as a counselor. If you can focus, also, you can be very confident. One thing about if you're the one you're focused on, you you know, okay, this is what it is. And, you know, so the, the one thing you have to watch out for, though, is I, I suppose that in terms of reasonableness, too is there are some things in law to law that are called curative provisos. Like in the criminal law, there's no substantial wrong and miscarriage of justice. There, you gotta remember the rules of court have that, at least in Alberta anyway, they have a no miscarriage of justice too. We're all civil matters. So if you're gonna walk in there and say, well, I've got this outrageous error by the trial judge, what difference did it make? And the, going back to the advocacy of someone like an Alex Pringle, Remember, he's using the findings of fact. He used the findings of fact of the trial judge. They're not the findings that he wanted. You take what the trial judge has found and you work with that. And if you're suggesting that there's a palpable and overriding error, then you, you know, then you say the trial judge found this. But the evidence on this point from you know witness A was X, not Y you know, witness um, B, something else, and just showing them why it's wrong. Not that you disagree with it, but that the trial judge misunderstood or forgot the evidence or didn't hear or what have you. And that's, by the way, is another thing too, is that we, we part of reasonableness is to depersonalize the system. One thing about barristers, and that's one thing I'm actually very proud of the barristers in this country. And like the Americans, you know, we wear robes for a reason. We have, we're all part of a big family, this outfit here, this rig we put on. And the honor of the, of the profession is actually, uh, I think, very much engaged. It's funny, when you put this on, you actually realize that you're part of this great system and you're making the rule of law work. And I found that, uh, generally speaking, it also encourages uh, civility amongst lawyers because that's, a, that's what I, the point I was stumbling toward. Um, there's, there's no reason not to be civil. Because after all, you're not the litigant. You're the you're the barrister. And uh, now it's true the barristers have the cab rank rule. Like that's a there's no principle. People don't hear about that anymore. But that's the idea that barristers step up and they act for clients because they're barristers, not because they like the client, not because they agree with the position taken by the client or any of this stuff. They do the best they can with the argument that the client has. And. Uh, now, so I, I'm very much impressed with that. Again, that was Alex Pringle and other lawyers in Calgary that uh, I'm sure Beth could identify where they say, my position is this. And you, what are you going to do? There is an honorable position. And then you answer. I guess you're out of time. Huh? Oh, no, okay. no, but, but we're out of slides. Oh, out of slides. Out, slide. out of slides. So are there any questions or um, some, we have said something that doesn't make sense? Probably. I suppose maybe I should, if, he's, if he's actually still here. Uh, I should give Eugene a chance to have a repost. Now, uh, just unmute yourselves if you have a question and uh, try not to step on each other's toes. Uh, Eugene is here, but he has no reply. <laughs> oh, good man. <laughs> Are there any other questions? Please don't be shy. 
Oh yeah. Know, don't be shy. Or anything else that yeah. you wanted to ask. Or an experience you've had where you thought, well, what the heck is this all about? I'll ask the yeah. question. Sure. Um, Can everybody hear, by the way? Hello. Uh, I think they can hear me. Hopefully. Okay. Yeah, they should be. I'll speak up. Just making that transition from factum to oral argument. Um, I don't know if you can come up with a general rule for this, but you explained, and this is my impression as well, that judges are very well prepared with respect to the written materials. So what is the most helpful way to approach oral, given that you've already kind of laid it all on the line to some degree? Well, encapsulate to start with. Again, for example, you've got, say you got two grounds of appeal. You say, you start off with saying, I have two grounds of appeal. The first one is, deals with X, and the second deals with Y. They say, now, uh, as far as X is concerned, but I'll, I'll talk about that, it's the subcategory. And you actually, in effect, what you're doing is you're giving almost like a, uh, uh, I don't know, a roadmap. Okay, and usually you can do that in the first couple of minutes, and it, and you say that um, the only area in this area, the thing where I think I'm I'm the weakest almost to start off. I say I would like to emphasize this because this is the most complicated one part of this, and then go right to it because it'll probably be the one the judges are interested in. The other thing too is judges. Like we talk about the hot court thing. Judges talk. Do you think I don't talk? <laughs> can you imagine my not sit, sitting there like a sphinx? I used to hate it when I was a crown attorney doing doing stuff, and I'd look at this oil painting of judges. You know, I I love to be engaged. I, in fact, it was fun. As a barrister, you want the judges to jump in and start asking questions. That's where you get your chance to really get your point across. You know, if you got a judge that's just sitting there like a lot of you, sort of like, oh my god. <laughs> I think that, as, especially as an appellant, to deal with yeah. Uh, as an other idea is there are times when after you've read the respondent's factum that you might wish to reorder your grounds of appeal. Yeah. And so you might say, you know, um, I am relying on my, or, you know, I do have the four grounds of appeal. Ground three, I will rely on my factum. I've got nothing I can add, but I'm going to begin with uh, ground four. Right. And then it, from there to one and to two. And your oral argument can deal with the written argument, but more importantly, it deals with your friend's written argument. And so that you begin to deal with both your submissions and theirs as to your submissions now before the court as to why you still think your ground of appeal has merit. And the other thing, too, is you're also focusing on the amount of time you have. Like yes. in most, most jurisdictions, we have 45 minutes limit in our, 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 our court, yeah. except for motions, sometimes they're 15 or something. But uh, and the Supreme Court of Canada is very rigorous now about time limits, they just don't. And understandably so, they haven't got time, especially we have you know, a dozen interveners or something. But um, so you, the one that's most complicated in your argument that you think is your best argument, I do that. Because you want to, if you have to spend half an hour on that, then at the end, you do like we just said. Okay, well, I haven't, have, I don't have time to cover items three and six, so I leave them before you with my rest material. And besides, you know, they, they were simple, that's why you didn't talk about them. You want to talk about the ones they don't understand, not the ones they do understand. Please jump in if you have questions. That was a very good question, by the way, so don't be discouraged. Yeah, no. Talk about an oil paint. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that way round. Okay, yeah. well, going once, going twice. And thank you very much for the uh, for the presentation. That was uh, very informative. Uh, as I said, uh, it will be up on our YouTube uh, channel later uh, in the week. And uh, we'll say goodbye. Okay. Okay. Thank you all. All right. Thank you, gentlemen.